Okay, so we'll talk about subsystems. So, a little bit of recall. It was a long time ago now. I guess two months ago or something like that. <laughs> so, remember we talked about, we had a lecture on identifying objects. We had a lecture on identifying responsibilities, collaborations, hierarchies. So we're in this stage. We analyzed, the last lecture was on hierarchies. And now we're identifying subsystems, right? So the goals are to simplify the patterns of communication, right? If you have lots of classes and objects that are communicating, you want to simplify those communication patterns as much as possible. And one way to do that is to identify subsystems. And then we can design interfaces to subsystems and the classes inside the subsystems to simplify the flow of information. Right, so we have collaboration graphs. We also talk about subsystem cards here. And, yeah, L nicely, n nicely in conjunction with this, Java has an interface keyword in an interface class that you can use. So collaborations represent the flow of information in your software. This is, this is the big challenge with object-oriented design, is trying to understand the flow of information. This is really the number one challenge in some ways, is trying to figure out the flow of control, the order in which events happen and the way information flows during execution. In order to do that, we try to come up with ways to depict that communication statically in a diagram, right, without any time-dependent uh, necessities or, or visualizations or things like that. So a static representation of all the paths. So a full collaboration graph includes classes and their hierarchies, interfaces, and collaborations. And we're going to talk about this. We're going to show some examples today. So a collaboration graph represents classes and class hierarchies using a nested representation. So this is a class hierarchy, right? We have a tool. It's an abstract class. And we have a child class called creation tool and selection tool. Well, that can also be represented in a nested way. So this, does this remind anybody of anything? Of the diagram that you've seen already? Right. I'm going. Exactly. It, it, it's, it kind of it reminds me of a Venn diagram. In this case, the interpretation is a selection tool is a kind of tool, and a creation tool is a kind of tool. But you can also represent <coughs> collaborations that way. Here's another way to represent collaborations. So we have a class called Drawing, and we have a class called Drawing Elements. And there's a, flow, there's a communication between the two classes. So that communication is represented by an arrow. In this case, the drawing would be the client class, and the drawing element would be the server class, so the communication is from the client to the server, right, and that's, and the, the communication is also given a label, like the number one, for example. So hidden behind this, this diagram is a method inside of drawing that calls drawing elements, methods inside the drawing elements class. One or more methods, one or more procedures. So this could be one or more procedures, right? Now what's a subsystem? A subsystem is a group of classes that collaborate with each other to fulfill some larger purpose, right? 
or to support <clears throat> a set of interfaces. So from the outside of the subsystem, these classes look like one unit, right? The classes work closely together to provide a clearly defined unit of functionality. We're going to go over some examples of this so it's not so abstract as we go along. From inside the subsystems, the classes collaborate in sometimes a complex network, right? Now, the, the idea is there's complexity inside the subsystem, maybe, but that complexity is hidden outside the subsystem. So from outside, you cannot see any complexity. And that's especially true about the communication inside the, sub, the subsystem. And a little side note of these two terms that sometimes can be confused, superclasses versus subsystems. So a superclass is a groups a set of classes with identical responsibilities, right, a parent class. That's not to be confused with a subsystem. A subsystem is a group of classes with distinct responsibilities. They don't have to overlap, so to speak. I think that's going to be very clear when we start showing some examples. Right? <coughs> they, they work together to fulfill some greater responsibility. They, there are three common subsystems in almost all pieces of software. And another side note before I mention that though is subsystems are not inherently different from classes in the sense that they're a group of objects and responsibilities, right? But they're, it's almost like a, a big, a very big class being formed out of multiple smaller classes, right? And we can define an interface to that subsystem that simplifies the patterns of communication. If you look at a, at a piece of software, you can almost always identify three subsystems. And if, if the person or people or the team designing the software took this module, for example, or they know about software design, then they will identify three common subsystems. Does anybody happen to know what they already are? So the, the user interface is very often a subsystem. So there's a... a that piece of software that interfaces with a user very often. Very common subsystem, so there'll be a number of classes that handle that interaction. Another very common subsystem is the data subsystem, and that is data storage. So file I.O., all the classes that deal with file I.O., <coughs> reading data from files. But that could be a database as well, or it could be a combination of files and databases. It's a data or a file I.O. or a data I.O. subsystem, very, very common, kind of universal. That could also be data coming from a network. So a network subsystem is very, very common if your software interfaces with a network. And then the other third, the third one, so the first one is user-oriented, the second one is data-oriented, the third one is processing-oriented. So you're having input on an abstract level from a data source, a person, and then there's some processing that takes place with those two inputs, right? And that's a processing subsystem. So almost always you can have these three subsystems in every piece of software. That's just to help you with your assignments. <laughs> but that's true about every piece of software. Right? So subsystems support collaboration. Collaboration from a class up outside the subsystem to a class inside the subsystems is redefined to be a collaboration with a subsystem. Right, so this collaboration between some a class and a print server 
which is represented by this edge and this number, is redefined as a collaboration with the subsystem itself. So this is a printing subsystem, right? And we don't allow any communication to occur between classes outside the subsystem directly with classes inside the subsystem. We define an interface to the subsystem. And then all our communications are channeled through the subsystem interface. So subsystems can help to simplify the design near the end of the design process. So that's where we are. <coughs> we're, we're at the end of the design process now. So we started with the object identification, responsibilities identification, collaborations, hierarchies, and subsystems. This is really the end of the design phase of, of the software principles. So sometimes people identify subsystems at the very beginning and then use a divide and conquer approach to, system, to software design. We did the opposite. We, we identified objects first, we identified responsibilities next, and then we grouped those objects together into subsystems and hierarchies. Right? But it could go in the opposite direction, especially based on the idea that you just now know, oh, there are almost always going to be three subsystems. Let's start assuming that there are three subsystems and then start to define the classes inside the subsystems. Right? From a design point of view, classes and subsystems are very, very similar. Right? So a subsystem can be decomposed into further subsystems and into classes, right? A subsystem could start out as a class, a class could evolve into a subsystem, and so on, right? So a class that has too many responsibilities or too com is too complex gets subdivided into a number of classes, right? And those are obvious candidates for a subsystem. In the final design, everything still is defined in terms of classes, right? But subsystems are a form of abstraction to help you with your, with your overall design. So the, the, the surprise in some ways is that subsystems don't actually exist, <laughs> right? They, all, all responsibilities are definitely delegated to classes and objects, right? You can't delegate a responsibility to a, a subsystem at the implementation stage, right? Everything belongs to a class in the end. So subsystems are conceptual units, so to speak. They don't necessarily exist. You don't instantiate a subsystem necessarily in your, in your program. Their classes exist during the execution, but they don't. <coughs> Sometimes, however, one of the classes in a subsystem is an interface class. So luckily, <coughs> Java supports interfaces, and that's, that can be used, an interface can be used to define a subsystem, right, which is that simplified pattern of communication. Subsystems don't directly fulfill responsibilities. They simply pass the responsibility on to a class. Right. Subsystems, the subsystem concept can lead to more general and flexible collaborations, and clients access those function, the functionality of a subsystem through the interface. So, Remember, the, the whole purpose of the subsystem is to simplify the, the complexity of communication, right? Especially, so to put up a wall between the, the inside of the subsystem and the outside. So the complexity inside the subsystem is hidden. And this might feel like deja vu, 
it feels like deja vu this this conversation well this this idea does anybody remember where we talked about this already about encapsulation encapsulation exactly so in in when we talked about encapsulation we talked about hiding the what an object can do from how it does it. And we, we used a boring example of the DVD player, which is already an outdated example. I think people don't buy DVD players anymore. But if it, you don't need to know how a DVD player works, right? You just need to know about the interface, the play button, the rewind button, and so on. It's the same idea with, with subsystems, but you're encapsulating communication. You're hiding the complexity of communication that goes on inside the subsystem. Right. New interfaces can be added without affecting old ones. Right. This is a major advantage of subsystem de definitions. So we already saw one example, a simple print subsystem that prints only ASCII files could be extended to include an interface that specifies a file type, right? This extension needs a new interface, but the old interface can still be supported without recoding old clients, right? That's just one example. We're going to look at more examples. And we can document subsystems, right? This looks just like a class card, the subsystem card, where we have a name for a subsystem, like drawing subsystem. We have a list of classes that go into the drawing subsystem, like drawing control point drawing elements. And then we have its responsibilities, right, for the purpose of the subsystem, to maintain and modify a drawing. Right. And we have these, these responsibilities, display a drawing, maintain drawing elements, modify a drawing element. And these are the classes that those responsibilities are delegated to. Right. This, is, this is the interface, so to speak, and then these are the actual classes that handle that communication or those requests. So that requires us to go back and revise the class definitions to collaborate with subsystem interfaces rather than a class and a subsystem. Right? So anybody that wants to collaborate with the drawing class will now collaborate with the drawing subsystem rather than the drawing class directly. So this helps abstraction and flexibility. And now everybody outside, all the classes outside the subsystem will not notice or will not be affected by changes inside the subsystem. So changes can be made inside the subsystem without affecting any communication patterns outside the subsystem. And that's, the, that's one of the, the main purposes of subsystems. You don't want to modify a class and have it break everything else. Right? That's, the, that's one of the main purposes or main goals. So identifying subsystems, how do we identify them? Collaboration graphs help to identify subsystems. So we look for so-called strongly coupled classes. That means how often do classes communicate with one another? How often does a class call another class? Coupling can be indicated by frequently used collaborations, right? Or a web of many collaborations. For me, subsystems are indicated conceptually, right? You know if a class is responsible or shares responsibility for printing, right? So if it does, it belongs in a printing subsystem. Or you, can, you know a class might be facilitating data, data input and output. So it belongs in a data input and output subsystem. 
it, conceptually, I think it's not very difficult to identify subsystems. So given a set of classes that appear to be strongly coupled, do they work together to fill some common goal of functionality? Do they have a common purpose? And can you name that common purpose or that, that common group? Right? If the answers to these are yes, then you have a subsystem. Here's a, an example of a drawing subsystem. <coughs> So this, again, remember we always use this example of the drawing editor, so we always come back to this, this program. In exercise one, we gave a partial specification of a drawing editor. Same with exercise two. This is a program that you can use to draw figures, boxes, and lines, and shapes. So the drawing subsystem of the drawing editor to maintain and display a drawing, right? We have these, these classes that are inside the subsystem, drawing, control point, drawing element, and their children. So these are the different responsibilities or interfaces or collaborations of the subsystem to display itself, maintain the elements in a drawing, modify an attribute of a drawing element, and so on. And these are the actual classes that carry out the responsibility, that carry out the functionality. But anybody that needs these, these responsibilities to be carried out will now interface with the drawing subsystem rather than the individual classes themselves. Here's what that looks like in a diagram, that same information. Right? We have the numbers, see those numbers here? One, two, three, four, five. Those numbers are now shown here. One, two, three, four, five. Right? We have a drawing subsystem. We have a draw another subsystem called drawing elements. And these are different classes inside those subsystems. And that's called a subsystem graph. Right? Now, this, this is the same subsystem drawn differently in the UML style. So that, then the question is, well, what is this style? If this is UML style, then what is this? This is the style from the book on which this lecture is based, the Designing Object Oriented Software book that you see on the last, on the last page of the notes. So they have a drawing style, Designing Object Oriented Software, and that's, this is the style that they use. And, but there's another style of drawing called the U Unified Modeling Language, or UML. And that's what the same subsystem looks like in UML. So UML is a standard, a standardized way of drawing a software design. So a group of very smart people said, let's come up with a standard way to draw software design. Standard set of diagrams and conventions and publish those, and that's what UML is, Cedarvide Modeling Language. So this is what the sub same subsystem looks like in UML style, and those numbers are replaced by labels now. Instead of, well, the numbers are hard to read, aren't they? So this is a little bit more easy to read. Instead of a number, we have a, a, just a, a nice word or phrase that describes the responsibility. And here you can you can see there's a combination of subsystem and hierarchy. Right? You have a subsystem, but here you also have a hierarchy. A linear element is a child of drawing element. Same, same with group and text. I, I find that to be confusing, personally, that, you, that we have this combination or a hybrid diagram. But that's how it is. It can be in UML. It doesn't have to be that way. 
Here's another subsystem example. Now this would correspond to the processing, or it could, it could correspond to the processing subsystem that I mentioned, the generic subsystem, right? editing subsystem. So there's going to be a user, inter user interface subsystem communicating with an editing system, right? So we have a drawing editor <coughs> subsystem and a, uh, another subsystem or a tool hierarchy, right? And that's another example of a subsystem drawn in UML style. And so this is what the drawing editor program could look like from the subsystem point of view, right? The GUI, that's again the user interface subsystem that I mentioned earlier on, right? very generic subsystem that belongs to many programs. Here's an editing subsystem, so all the changes that the user can make to a, the drawings, and then every drawing subsystem, which will implicitly have inside there the file I.O. and data I.O. subsystems, right? So we can look at this in a little bit more detail. So what is, what is happening in, in interface 6, right? Interpreting the user input, who is its client. So we can look at this at a little bit in a little bit more detail. Here's the same schematic drawn in UML style, right? This is the style of the book that we're basing the lecture on. And this is the same set of subsystems drawn in UML style. So in the assignment, you are asked to use which style, Tom? The book. The book style, okay. So we have the GUI application. Now, we don't have the number six anymore. We have uh, a label, interpret user interface, in in interpret user input, and so on. So subsystems help to simplify the class interactions, right? Because complex interactions are difficult to maintain and lead to so-called spaghetti code, right? This is something we want to avoid. We don't want to have one class interfacing and communicating with all the other classes in a, in a piece of software and an application. That's, that's generally to be avoided. So we want to simplify the interactions as much as possible. And if we identify areas of complex communication, we can try to we can propose some strategies to simplify the collaboration or the communication. Right? So how can we do that? We can minimize collaborations of a class with other classes and subsystems, <coughs> minimize the number of classes to which a subsystem delegates responsibilities, and minimize the number of different interfaces supported by a class or a subsystem. And we're going to go through an example of this, right? So to minimize the collaborations of a class, a class or a software design is simpler with fewer collaborations. So we try to reduce the collaborations. And how one strategy to do that is reassigning responsibilities to interfaces to create fewer collaborations. So in italicized texts, we have this idea of centralizing communications flowing into subsystems by creating an interface class. Right? So let's look at that. <clears throat> this is a, a printer subsystem example. And if we want to print something, it should be si as simple as possible for anybody outside the subsystem. Right? This is something we really don't want to spend much effort in doing. Right? So we define a 
printing or print subsystem. And it takes a file, it sends it to the printer, it associates it with a printer, and, and notifies the operator. Right? So we have a file as input, we might have a console subsystem. The details of printing are something that nobody's interested in. Right? So printing something should be as simple as possible from any class outside the printing subsystem. Right? By minimizing the number of classes that receive a subsystem interface delegation directly, you can hide more of the subsystem and better encapsulation of the subsystem. A well-designed subsystem limits the number of classes that are delegated interfaces. So typically, you would have defined an interface class for a subsystem. Right? That's how you would implement your subsystems in Java. Right? So here's an example, another example. Imagine, this is not the drawing editor example, the exciting drawing editor. This is a sort of a retail software setting example. So imagine we are trying to sell something. Some things, and those things are stored in a warehouse, right? We have a till cash register. And if we're trying to, to sell things, we always have an inventory system a transaction log and an accounting subsystem. Right? These are basic responsibilities for anybody in the business of selling things. So we could put these three things into a subsystem. They fulfill a common purpose, right? They keep track of inventory, this subsystem. Right? They keep track of where the inventory is, when the inventory changed, and transactions, monetary transactions. And on the outside of this subsystem, we have a cash register class and a warehouse class. We could have multiple warehouses cl classes, by the way, different warehouses. And there are three collaborations going on here, from the outside to the inside. So cash register collaborates with inventory, transactions, and the accounting, and so does the warehouse. And it's a little bit complicated. So to simplify the pattern of communication, we can, com we can introduce an inventory subsystem and introduce an inventory manager interface class. Right, that simplifies the patterns of communication. So now the cash register and the warehouse communicate through the inventory manager interface or subsystem, rather than the cash register asking inventory for something, the trend, making another transaction log and an accounting subsystem. And now we can make changes inside the subsystem as well without affecting any, anything on the outside of the subsystem. Maybe the transaction log changes. Maybe the transaction log goes from a local machine to a machine over a network. Right? We can make that change in the transaction log without affecting any of the communication outside the subsystem. Right? So any changes made here are not reflected out here. Right? So we don't break, nothing breaks. That's the idea. <clears throat> so minimizing interfaces of a subsystem. Right here's a subsystem with one, two, three, four, five, six interfaces that could be simplified by replacing these six with two interfaces in the subsystem and then we delegating the remaining communication to inside to classes inside the subsystem. 
or other subsystems, right? So now that we know what subsystems are, we define subsystems, and we know how to identify them, we have to review our original design. Right in the original design, there you have a set of class cards, right? and on those class cards, you have the class name and the responsibilities, <coughs> and with whom they collaborate. Now all the collaborations have changed, so we have new interfaces. We have to redefine the collaboration. We might have new classes, interface classes, and possibly quite a a, a substantial dis redesign. So that means any hierarchy, hierarchies that we defined previously need to be revisited and make sure they're consistent with the new <coughs> subsystems that you've identified. Right? So we need to make sure all the patterns of communication are updated according to the new subsystems that you may define right, in your design before doing the bottom-up approach. To design. And that's the last phase of the design. Well, not the very last. So the next in the next lecture we make the transition. Now if I, I'm gonna perform a psychic exercise <laughs> and try to read your collective minds to start the semester. And I'm getting signals. I'm picking up signals that say, well, I don't believe, or well, how is this design supposed to translate into an actual implementation that just seems impossible? I, I don't understand how to make the jump from the design to an actual implementation. Am I reading, picking up the signals probably? Yeah, that's what I, that's what I thought. I could, I could hear the, 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 the signal. That's what the next lecture is about. How to, now you have a design, right? We've gone through this extensive design process. How do we now take the design and implement it, turn it into an implementation? And that's the next, the next lecture. It's, it's very exciting, actually. I remember sitting in your seats and thinking, there's no way this is going to work. That's what I was thinking when I was in your seat, I, that this isn't going to work. I was wrong. I thought, that this, this can't work. Like There's no way to make this into an implementation. But I was very wrong. I'm happy to be wrong in that case, actually. Any questions? About this or previous lectures or the assignment, any announcements? Any other announcements, Tom? We need to make. Uh, I don't. Well, other than guys, you know, just begin the course with make sure you keep checking the blackboard pages. Um, there was one mistake in one in the assignment. It's not a big one. It was pointed out to me. Just I defined the deck size to be wrong. I'm tricking myself, but that shouldn't affect this course with at all. So just make sure you regularly check the information on Blackboard rather than just getting one copy. Um, Is the attendance register somewhere? Did everybody sign that? Yeah. Yeah. That's important, the attendance register, because we're trying to figure out who attends the class and who doesn't attend it. So. Because you need to attend the lecture in order to effectively communicate with your other group members. So if you're not attending lecture, then that's a missed opportunity to communicate with your other group members and get the assignments done. So we're trying to identify potential non-contributors with the attendance register. Okay, so we're finished. Make sure you sign the attendance register before you go.
Yeah. 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 Yeah.